the, what you can see here is I have uh, two wallets. So I'll, we can, it, we'll go into exactly how this works, but I kind of want to just give everyone who hasn't seen this before a feel for what Interledger looks like or what the experience we're going for is. So on the left and right, you have two different wallets, and they happen to be running the same software, but what we're trying to say is you could imagine these being two completely separate ones where they're actually running, these, these two are actually running on different systems, uh, even though it's the same tech stack underneath. But you could imagine one side being PayPal and the other side being something completely different, like a Bitcoin wallet or something. Um, and so the normal experience of any one of these is you can, you know, you can send, send some money to a, to a local account and like, you know, that's all well and good and that's cool and it goes through. Great. Um, but what we really want to be able to do is do something a little bit more like this, where we want to say, I'm on one system and I want to send money over to you on this completely different system. And I don't want to think about any of that the routing stuff that Stefan was talking about. I just want it to go through. It should just, just sort of work like magic. So send a little message. Hi there. Um, and so what we want to be able to do is specify either the, I, you know, I want to specify the source currency. So if I say 10, then it will tell me, oh, like 8 point something euros. This is dollars and euros, if you can see. Um, we'll get there. Or I maybe want to say, actually, I want Bob to get exactly 10. And you can see it, I need to send a little bit more than 11. So if I send that through, um, and as I said, haven't pissed off the demo gods, um, then, oh. I apparently did. Um, let me try just reloading. Apologies. All right. Um, so what you can see is like the, the payment goes through right away as if I reload. Um, but it, the payment goes through right away, even though these two are on completely different ledgers and use different currencies. But the experience is just, oh, I want to send you a certain amount. Great. And it just goes through. So. Stefan was kind of alluding to some of the exciting things that we can do with this, the kind of more advanced use cases. So I want to show one of those off and now really hoping I didn't piss off the, the demo gods. So what I have here is um, there's a project called WebTorrent, which is about building uh, torrents, which is a file sharing app, into the browser. So it's a complete re-implementation in JavaScript. And so what I've done is modified that to add interledger payments so that you actually pay the people that are sending you content. Um, so let's see if this will. I don't know what that was. but um, So what this is showing off is that uh, the downloader is going to be paying little bits of money um, hopefully, yep, maybe, yes. Um, and if you see it, um, oh, thanks. Yeah, really. Wow. Um, so what, what this is trying to show off, and unfortunately not, not working right now, the idea is that you can add Interledger into other things because you can actually assume that you can pay anybody in the world, just like you can assume that you can send messages to anybody in the world. Did it go through? OK, great. So now you can, if you can see, um, in response to getting the payment, the seeder is actually uploading this content. And so this is all happening automatically without me, you know, look, look, Mon, no hands. Um, like, this can all happen automatically and can send little tiny bits of money, no matter what currency or ledger people are on. And so you could build these interledger payment, micropayments, into lots of different applications. So those are some of the kind of more out there exciting use cases that we think this could be useful for. If you have this network of networks where everyone is connected to one another and can actually just assume, like, yeah, of course I can send you money. Like, we're connected by interledger, of course. Um, so now that that just finished, perfect timing. Um, so now I'm going to go back to explain how this works. Um, so how this works. Uh, apologies for those who already know how it works, but maybe some people could use, could use a refresher. And also, we've kind of updated the way we think about some of these things. So uh, as Stefan was explaining, ledgers track accounts and balances. But not everyone is on the same ledger. So we need connectors to relay money. And something that 
connectors also do is they also exchange currencies. So e each ledger has a different currency, and connectors are the ones that provide some rate saying, you pay me this much on one system and I'll pay out on another. And so with the red and blue demo that I was showing off, which you can actually try out by yourself, I forgot to mention that. If you go to red.ilpdemo.org or blue, um, you can try it out yourself. So there's actually a connector sitting between those two that's offering to exchange the currencies of those two ledgers. And so in real time, when you want to make a payment, you can ask it for a quote and it says, this is how much it'll cost you. So how do we actually ask a connector to do something for us? You know, if we're, we're there, you know, Stefan is described this whole system where there's connectors and ledgers, but if the connector's just sitting there, how, how do we actually tell it something? Um, so this is what Stefan was getting at before, where you have the hierarchical identifier, the, the address, and the amount. Um, and you, you can really think of that as like, imagine you're, you're putting an address on a little packet or a, an, on, an envelope, and you want to send that along. And so what actually happens, the way Interledger works, is that the sender writes this little packet and attaches it to a local transfer. So that's a transfer to the connector. Um, and the connector forwards that on. They, they look at the address it's trying to go to, they use the routing algorithms, which we'll get into more later, and they forward it on. They deliver the amount to the recipient. And with that, we can have these short paths or these long paths. Um, Uh-oh. Um, so the question is, can we trust connectors? Um, like, there's this party. I'm going to send money to them. Can, are they actually reliable? Are they actually going to forward on my money? What happens if they just run away with it? That's obviously a non-starter. We cannot be setting this great network up where there's like a 90% chance that your money gets stolen every time. Um, so if connectors fail, would we lose money? That's what we have to solve. So we use holds to provide security. I'll explain what that looks like. So when we talk about holds, uh, or th this is what's described in the paper, as we, we're used, used to call it escrow. It seems like holds are actually a better term for it. But uh, the ledgers are the ones that actually provide this. So it's not necessarily, it's in most scenarios, not a third party service. It's just the ledger, kind of like when you check into a hotel, and they put a hold on your credit card. Just saying you can't use this money for anything else during, the, during this time. Um, so what they're all about is the holds depend on conditions and expiries. And so when a condition is, a cryptographic condition is fulfilled, that executes a transfer. But if a timeout is reached before it's fulfilled, then the transfer goes back. So the idea is I want to put, put money on hold, and if somebody can fulfill the condition before the timeout, great. They, the money will go through. Otherwise, the money comes back to me. So this is the, the more full view of Interledger, as uh, Stefan kind of briefly touched on. So you have the address, the amount, the expiry, and the condition. So the way the flow works in uh, what's called universal mode of the protocol, uh, funds are committed or put on hold from left to right. And just kind of walk through that quickly so you can get a, get a sense of it. So you, you take that same kind of packet format from before, um, and you have the address, the amount, the condition, and the expiry. And so the sender puts their money on a hold. So that, that actually means that the, the ledger takes the money out of the sender's account and puts it, puts it on hold so that the sender can't touch it, nobody else can touch it. But it has a condition attached to it as well as an expiry. So then the connector gets the notification that says, hey, you have money on hold. The connector doesn't trust me, the sender, or Alice in this case, um, but they trust that, that ledger to, if they, if they say money's on hold, money's on hold. So then the connector goes ahead and is like, all right, you put money on hold for me, I'll go do the same for you on the other side. So the connector puts money on hold on the, on the next ledger. So at this point, nobody has actually transferred any money, but money is on hold on across all of these different ledgers. So the recipient gets the notification, money's on hold for you. You haven't actually gotten any money, but it's almost here. Um, and so then what the recipient does is they trigger the transfer to execute by fulfilling that original condition. So transfers are then executed from right to left. So it starts with the recipient signs a receipt. This is the, what was agreed upon before. The recipient says, yep, I, this is a cryptographic proof that I got the payment. 
Since that signature fulfills the condition, that triggers the transfer on the right-hand side to execute. So at this point, the recipient has been paid. Great. So now the recipient's been paid, but this connector in the middle is out the money. They've basically paid out money before actually getting paid by the other side. So they need to get reimbursed. So what they do is when the ledger notifies them uh, or when they get the, the notification that the funds have actually been released, that shows them that same cryptographic proof that the recipient got paid. So they take that and they pass it on. So the connector passes it on to the next ledger. That fulfills the same condition and that, ex that executes the source transfer. And so what happens there is then the sender ends up with this non-repudiable cryptographic proof that the recipient got paid, and that's kind of how this works. And so in summary, transfers are committed or put on hold from left to right and executed from right to left. And this is, can happen across any number of ledgers. So now paths can be short or long, um, and they can be long while still being secure. So even if there's some kind of malicious party in the middle, the worst that will happen is the payment will roll back, but they can't actually steal money. So that's what lets us, lets us build this kind of global network of networks or interledger. And all of that's really enabled by this very simple packet format. We really want to emphasize like, what makes the internet so powerful is that all that everybody has to agree on is a relatively simple addressing format. And that, that gives us a lot of power because all of, the, all of the differences between different net ledgers or networks are abstracted away underneath, as Stefan was showing before. And we, all the routing decisions can be, kind of happen in the background. And all I need to know is what's the address I'm trying to pay? How much money do I want to actually have them receive? When do I want this all to happen by? You know, this could be just seconds later or something. And then I want to put a condition so that it's actually secured across this chain. So how do these addresses and routing actually work? That's where Stefan comes. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things about the second workshop is that we noticed that um, we spent a couple of months just trying to simplify things down, simplify things down, and so you get to a point where, well, now you don't have a lot to talk about anymore. Well, we've pretty much exhausted the number of times we can show that packet slide. Um, but there's one area within Interledger that sort of keeps on giving in terms of complexity, which is routing. Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that here. Um, so first of all, you've seen this address before, but um, it's probably good to kind of break this down a little bit more. Um, so one of the things you could see there is that it's kind of um, broken up in these sections by dots. Um, and these dots are really pretty arbitrary. They sort of mean like, here's a hierarchy, like there's sort of this highest level this, uh, identifier at the beginning, then something a little bit more specific, and then something even more specific, and you could pretty much keep going. And so it's similar to domain names, but it's kind of in the, in the reverse order. Um, and if you're interested in why, then I think you have to look at ticket number 31 on the RFC's repo, a little plug. Um, but basically, um, you can read it from left to right. You can basically say, okay, there's some ledger that's in the US, um, some bank called WF, what could that, what could that be? Um, and then uh, some account, um, so apparently Bob's. And one of the things that's nice about that is if Bob now wants to go, and let's say um, he actually has a bunch of different devices um, and they all spend money, or maybe he has a, a daughter um, that has an allowance and so on, maybe he wants to be his own ledger. Um, and so one of the nice things about this hierarchical identifier is that you can actually do that. Um, so you can basically just say like, well, here's this other uh, account, which is basically an account that I have on my ledger, um, but the way that you find me is by reading the address from the left. So it kind of gives you this nice little extensibility in terms of um, you know, people can create more and more addresses around that. Now, before I get into sort of the nitty gritty of how do you parse this address and like how do you actually know which direction you need to forward a payment to um, based on this address, I want to kind of cover some basics first, um, which is you've seen the slide in, in Evan's section which is showing you um, the different rates, but where do these rates actually come from? And so um, where it comes from is that the connector is called Connie. Um, she actually defines what that rate should be. Um, the way we do that in the actual implementation is we have what we call the, the rate backend. Um, and the rate backend um, could get the rate pretty much from anywhere. Um, it could be 
uh, like one, our, one, one thing our demo implementation does is it goes to Fixer.io, uh, which is a web service and just gets like an exchange rate, an official exchange rate for the currency pair that's being traded, and then adds a little bit of a spread. Um, but it could also basically, uh, you know, log into a uh, exchange and get an, a, a rate curve, a, a, an order depth, a order book depth from that exchange. So basically, if you have something like a Bitcoin exchange and people are trading Bitcoins for dollars, you can get the top of the order book and get the, the rates from and the sizes of the orders and then basically um, assemble them into this curve. And the way that you look at this curve if you, that you see at the bottom, the way you look at that is your x-axis is how much money you're putting in and your y-axis is how much money you're getting out. Um, and that's enough information to kind of describe all sorts of um, different relationships, like if I have a fixed rate policy, it's just going to be a line. If I have a fixed rate policy that has a minimum amount to send, then it's going to be at zero and then jump up and then go in a line. Um, if you have a maximum amount, it's going to flatten off. Um, if you have an order book, then as you get to worse and worse orders, it's sort of going to taper off and you're going to get less and less out, even if you put a lot more in. Um, and so all these kinds of different liquidity scenarios you can describe by this curve. Um, and so that's, that's our main input into the routing algorithm. Now, Connie is not just trading on one ledger. She's trading on these three ledgers, B, C, and D, um, and she's connecting them all to ledger A. And I could have drawn this from the perspective of ledger B. I could have drawn this from the perspective of ledger C. Um, I've chosen to draw it from the perspective of ledger A, but you can kind of imagine that Connie does this for every source ledger. And so what she does is she basically writes down this routing table, which shows um, all of her different rate curves from the perspective of ledger A to ledger B. Um, so if, if A is dollars and B is euros, then the rate from A to B would be her rate for trading dollars for euros. Um, and she might also have some more uh, complex rules around that, around uh, managing her liquidity more efficiently. So for instance, if she's running low on one ledger, she might raise the rate so that um, she can squeeze a little bit more profit out of the last little bit of money she has before she is re-upping. Uh, re 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 um, now, obviously, this is not so useful if just she's the only one knowing about it. And so she's actually advertising those routes to other connectors. And so um, there's this other connector, let's call him Carmine, um, and they're on the same ledger that, that uh, Connie is on. And so Connie tells Carmine about um, this route that she has from, to go from A to B. And Carmine gets this route, and he has a route from this ledger Z on the left uh, to ledger A. And so what he needs to do is he needs to combine those two routes together. And so you get this combined route from A through, sorry, from Z to, through A to B. Um, and with that, you also get this combined liquidity curve. Um, the nice thing is that the combined curve isn't actually more data than the original curves. You can, you can simplify those curves um, to sort of a constant size. Um, and so what that lets you do is it, it lets you express um, however long of a path you want with, with one liquidity curve. Um, and so that kind of keeps the data that you need to store a little bit in check. Okay. Um, now, uh, Carmine does that for every curve that he receives, um, and so he ends up with this um, routing table, which basically says, like, well, if you want to go to B, you can go through A, through Connie. Um, if you want to go to, th to C, um, uh, you can go through Connie, and so on. And these can get longer and longer. These paths can get longer and longer. Um, and the only thing that, that, um, uh, that is being stored next to the, the actual route, the actual path, is what the next hop should be. So you need to know uh, what, what is the next hop that I need to send to um, in order to take advantage of this rate that's being advertised. Um, but it actually, I don't care so much about what the, the future hops are. Um, you do transmit it mostly to detect loops, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, now, the problem with these routing tables is that they tend to grow pretty quickly. So, um, you know, after a short while, you have sort of this long list of routes. I apologize for some of the layout errors here, but um, basically, you just add more and more routes, and this gets pretty big pretty quickly. And that's exactly what happened with the internet. And so one of the biggest problems you have to solve with routing is how to make it scalable routing. How do you make it work for you know, millions of ledgers, billions of ledgers, even if we assume like every device is going to have its own ledger and its own sub-accounts? And so one of the things that, that's happening on the internet is that um, you actually only look at sort of these top-level systems, and so you don't know every host inside of those systems. You don't know every host and every network. You just look at these what's called autonomous systems, um, which are basically um, organizations getting assigned entire ranges of IP addresses. And so what you're routing to is actually not the full IP address. So you don't have every possible IP address in your routing table. You have prefixes, and the prefixes correspond to different ASs, autonomous systems. Um, and so as long as you know which direction you need to route to get to a specific prefix, then you can trust that somewhere near there, someone near there is going to route it to the right host. Um, 
And so, again, a high level, that's kind of how it works. Um, there's another trick that, that's being done there, which is um, you can distinguish between sort of the core, where people do this very heavy routing, where they need these big routing tables, for everyone that they could possibly route to, um, and they exchange those routing tables on that level. But then you have your home router, and your home router does not participate in this protocol. Um, the protocol that's being spoken at the tier one level at, uh, between ISPs is called the BGP, the, the Border Gateway Protocol. Um, named after the border gateways, which is our, the, the routers that are basically at the corners of these autonomous systems. Um, but your router at home does not speak the border gateway protocol at all. It doesn't participate in that at all. And so the way that it works is that it knows, uh, it could be one of those nodes uh, at the left. So like this could be your home router and this could be your computer. Um, and so your home router knows that everything I need to send, I just send it to my ISP. I don't even like, unless it's like a local route on my local network, I'm gonna send everything to my ISP and my ISP knows how to route it. Um, and if something comes in from my ISP, maybe I know how to break it down and, and send it to the right host locally, but it's pretty much this sort of top-down model where I just have an ISP, that's what I send to, um, that's what I know. And so if we go back to this example of like, okay, we have some uh, payment that we're trying to make and we have this address that we're trying to get to, um, the first thing that we do is just route up to our ISP. So if I kind of show you this, so um, it just goes straight up to the ISP. Um, but that's only one third of the way there, pretty much, because uh, we still have to get across and we still have to get down to the recipient who might also be um, on sort of a, a, one of those peripheral nodes. Um, and so we have this address, and so now our ISP needs to recognize some prefix. And so in this case, we're gonna say like, they recognize this us.wf prefix, and so now they, they know the route that they need to forward it to. Um, and they might not know the whole route, but they know the next hop. And then as it gets closer and closer, eventually you reach this um, ledger that represents that prefix, which could be us.wf. Um, and now that we're here, we need to route down to a specific user. And the way that that works is that there are a bunch of users that have accounts on this ledger, but we know based on the address which one we are, we're trying to go to because the next element of the address is the one that we're, we're trying to reach. Um, and then to get to the final destination, we just do that same thing again. Um, so one thing you might notice is that this ledger at the top uh, right here um, is actually called us.wf, um, not just us. Why doesn't it start at the first element? Um, and the reason for that is that not every element has to be a real ledger. Some elements might just be more like informational. Um, so us isn't really a ledger, it's just sort of a direction. Um, so if I have, uh, I know some bank in the us, it's probably a good idea to route towards that if someone wants to get to us.wf. Um, and so some of these might not be real ledgers, they might just be more directions that you're trying to route towards. And so with that, I think, Evan, can, can you come back up? Um, and now we have some time for questions. Uh, I think quite a bit of time, so shoot at us. <laughs> <laughs> Grab my water too. Hold on one second, John. Yeah. Hey Evan, how are you? John Whelan is my name. I'm with uh, Banco Santander in Madrid. I right, dropped the beat. <laughs> um, I will. <laughs> Uh, question for you. Okay, so we talk about money moving across the different ledgers, but in reality, it's not really money yet. It's actually ownership of balances that changes. Mm -hmm. And in order to facilitate the transactions, um, the market makers, the connectors, I guess, need to provide liquidity via pre-funding. And at some point, as uh, payments flow across the network, liquidity on one side or the other side runs out. So we run into the traditional settlement problem that uh, we experience, I think, in all of the um, existing cryptocurrency platforms that are trying to facilitate real currency transactions. Um, have you given any additional thought to what's going to be required um, from a liquidity point of view to actually facilitate the, ki the kinds of future payments flows that, that you're anticipating here? Yeah, so, so there are a number of different ways to answer that, and, and one of them is, um, you know, eventually, maybe one day, all of the central banks will be LP enabled and so on, and so maybe um, payments will just go through that root ledger and everything will be good money. Um, but that's probably not near term, and it's probably not the most realistic answer. So I think what's a little bit more realistic is to think of 
how does Visa do it today, where they basically create the settlement solution out of the, the uh, transactions that they've cleared. Um, and connectors could do something very similar, where either individually or together, they generate what is their net that they've been processing, um, you know, where are their cash positions, um, and then basically do transfers through whatever existing systems that are out there, like Fedwire, uh, CHAP, CHIPS, um, all these kinds of systems. Um, in order to get their balances back in 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 what they consider like a, a starting position or starting state, um, and one of the things that we're going to show off later is kind of like how you can apply that idea towards um, you know reaching more people on Interledger. So um, you know if Evan and I um, have a way to clear with each other um, and we have a way to settle, which might not be ILP enabled, we can still transact. Um, so we're very actively thinking about like how to utilize the difference between clearing and settlement, where clearing you can do just if you have a way to communicate, and settlement you need some underlying system, but that system might not have to be LP enabled. So more on that later, so I'm not gonna uh, you know, spend too much more time talking about it. A big part of that is that it's completely fine if the, act the actual settlement can go through some other system, and that can be slower. That it's one of those systems that Stefan started out saying that the current, a lot of the current money transfer systems are meant for higher value, lower volume payments. And so, at the end of the day, or however long, however often you need to, you know, re um, reassess what the balances are, your balances are in different places. That's completely fine if that takes a little bit longer, uh, because you can still facilitate lots and lots of payments especially if the flows match in any way. More questions? Do you assume one asset type per ledger in the system? I didn't see currency anywhere. So the, the question was, do we assume one asset type per ledger? Uh, the answer is yes. And the reason that we assume that is because you, you have to be able to send, we, we think of a ledger as like, uh, anywhere where one account can send to any other account. And so if you have, you right now we the, the word ledger is used in a bunch of different contexts and so there are ledgers that have multiple ledgers within them that track different types of balances. And so we think of that as each, each asset type has to be on its own ledger so that anyone on that can transfer easily within one another. But then you need some party that's going to provide some kind of exchange rate between them. And so it's useful to think of it as like one, one asset per ledger, connectors, connectos. And a connector could be an actual system or it could be a kind of logical thing within one entity. Like a, a single bank could have many interledger ledgers as well as its own kind of internal connectors between them that provide the exchange. Uh, so yeah, so one one asset per ledger. Yeah, so the, the road towards financial standards is always paved with all these like traps that you can fall into, and one of them is definitely around the fee um, logic, where if you add you know ten different ways to express fees, you have added ten different layers of complexity to your protocol. Um, and so what we try to do with Interledger is we try to say, well, any time that you you can put in a certain amount of money and get the same amount of money out, that's a ledger. And any time that there is any kind of different amount, that means that some connector in between has done something um, like a currency exchange or maybe charge the fee or whatnot. Um, one quick note on that, why we're able to do that is um, we assume that the sender pays the fee that the ledger charges, the sending ledger charges, and then we assume that each connector pays the fee for the next transfer over. Um, and that way we can assume that ledgers don't charge fees essentially because connectors either incorporate them into their cost or um, the sender carries the, the initial one. So um, with that, we basically have these like completely frictionless ledgers and then connectors that are arbitrary in terms of how they're, how they're structuring their fees. And a question in the back. Sorry, Adrian. <laughs> How does the router table make sure that they're transferring, um, they're initiating the transfer through the most either cheapest route or be the fastest one? Um, so you are actually making that determination up front when you're populating the routing table to begin with. So um, when a router, uh, when connectors are advertising their routes, um, other routers will, other connectors will um, get those advertisements um, and try to incorporate those routes into their routing tables. And they will only keep the best one around. Um, actually, one uh, point that I didn't explain in the slides is um, if you have a route that's, that's being advertised to you that is cheap for very small payments, let's say, and you have another one that's, that's cheap for very large payments, you might actually combine those two and then remember that for 
payments between those two sizes, you're sending to this next hop, and for payments between those two sizes, you're sending to that next hop. And so by the time that we're actually doing a payment, we just look up in the routing table, you, we look up, okay, first what's the destination, and what's the size, and then the entry that's in there is the next connector we need to send to that's gonna be the cheapest for this payment. Um, and one nice thing about that is, is you know, that's the reason the demo is so fast. That's the reason you, know, you can type in an, an amount and instantly get the answer of how much that, uh, that's gonna cost is because it's just a, a relatively local lookup. We don't have to go out and crawl the network on, on demand um, as we used to when we first started out. Uh, so your protocol is dependent on having a kind of escrow between the user and the connector in a kind of a ledger or a payment system. But surely in these payment systems, someone has to be legally responsible for that money at all times. So who is going to be in charge of that escrow? Because to my knowledge, that doesn't exist right now. Mm. So be an issue. Yeah. Um, so basically, the, the way that we envision it working ideally um, is that the ledger um, is enforcing the hold. Um, and basically, you can think of it as just like Visa will let a merchant put money on hold um, and then later uh, push it forward, um, we can pre-agree on what the condition is that will actually release the hold. Um, and so we have just this very uh, basic cryptographic description of what is the condition. Um, and then the ledger can, without understanding the particular use case as to why are people using this feature, um, hold money for, for the, its customers. And we think that that's such a, a fundamental um, you know, feature for ledgers, and there's so many things you can do with it. You can tie it into smart contracts, you can tie it into, into ledger payments, and so on, um, that we think there's enough of a reason for ledgers to add that feature. Um, a lot of the partners that we work with, we know that their core systems already support holes, um, and so it's just a matter of adding this um, cryptographic verification that, that you need. And as I mentioned earlier, um, cryptocurrencies already support this kind of thing uh, out of the box. So um, there's a lot of in, in, existing support. And then, as I mentioned earlier as well, um, we're going to show uh, something off later, which is, okay, if you're on a ledger that doesn't support that yet, um, what do you do? Um, so there's, there's going to be some more to come than that. Oh. Hi there. Um, one thing that, that worries me a little bit is the whole advertisement of routes and liquidity and everything else. That's likely to be tied to things like foreign exchange rates and all those things. And we know, in certainly in the banking sector that I've worked with, it changes quite frequently. There's new bids, new offers, new things all the time. And just from a technical perspective, how do you propose to sort of dampen and manage the, the frequency of changes so that we're not perpetually in churn, perpetually seeing new routes popping up all the time and potentially missing good routes because of that? Great question. So there's a, there's a balance between how frequently you want to update your, your rates, obviously, be, and a lot of that depends on like where it, which kind of connector you are. And so one way to handle that is, as Stefan was describing, there's this if there's this kind of core of very connected ledgers that are very sophisticated systems, like not running on my phone, but actual physical, you know, Big, big installations, those systems might want to keep track of like the absolute best rate, and they might be perfectly well set up to handle mi you know, microsecond updates and things like that. As you get further out, you'd probably want to like have a little bit more buffer on that. So the, your home connector might not advertise to you the absolute best latest rate. They might give a little bit more because like have a little bit of a buffer there because I don't actually care about the difference between like you know 0. 0.00005 and like 0. 0.00051. Um, but the connector might because they're doing lots and lots of payments, so they might kind of keep that information. But to me, that's sort of irrelevant. And so you can think of it as like the the further out you are, probably the less frequently you'd want updates and the more of a buffer you'd want. But obviously that buffer is very much dependent on how volatile the exchange rates are. So between very volatile currencies, connectors are probably going to be giving you, between with volatile currency pairs, you're going to get a slightly worse rate if that buffer needs to take into account that fluctuation. Quick corollary question then. Uh, so does that mean that you might get limited term offers on particular routes to say this route is good for the next 10 seconds, 10 minutes or whatever? Yeah, so routes in general expire after a few seconds. So this entire process of advertising routes renews like constantly. And so 
Um, we don't have this particular demo uh, here today, but basically when you run the, the Five Bells demo that's, that's up on the website, uh, and you look at the console, you'll see these like hundreds and hundreds of messages around route advertisements scrolling through. And so we imagine that at least on this, in this core tier, um, routes will get uh, renewed very, very often. Also, one, one way to look at it is that connectors will advertise their routes as, as frequently as they want, and then if, you, if you're a connector that's not, say, updating correctly or something like that, if I, there's, two, there's two things that can happen. Either your rates are going to be worse than someone who is better reflecting that information, or I'm going to try to send it through you, and then maybe the rate will have changed and it will fail, because what will happen is not enough money will actually get to the recipient on hold, and so the recipient will never sign the, the receipt, and the, everything will just time out and come back. And so, to me, that just looks like you're a very ineffective connector. You're not very reliable. Every time I try you, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So next time I'm going to try somebody else. And kind of the whole, the whole point with this is that if you can, if there's no risk that the connector can just run away with your money, you're taking away the, the safety need. And so then you can have a very competitive landscape of lots of different connectors. So I could just, you know, try somebody else next time who's more reliable. I think the, the nice thing is that the incentives in the ecosystem all work really well, right? So as a connector, you're incentivized to be a good connector. It, the better you are, the tighter the spreads are that you can offer. And then the more space you have to add margin for yourself as well. So, so the better you are as a connector in finding good routes, finding good quotes, um, the more opportunity you have to earn money for yourself uh, and still offer a good service downstream. So it's, it's quite a nice sort of um, system in terms of that market forces and incentives between all the participants. So, uh, anybody who hasn't asked a question yet want to just... A lot of times. Okay. <laughs> just want to lose... You just don't want to run around the room all the time. <laughs> Just a quick question about the cryptographic proofs that you say propagate from right to left. Can your system handle a system like Bitcoin where there's non-finality of settlement, where you might have to pr prove, uh, say, six confirmations before something moves? Or how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Bitcoin is definitely a, um, an interesting system to integrate because of some of the quirks um, in how it works. Um, so I wouldn't presume to be like the biggest expert in the world on that. Um, there's other projects that are really focused on that part. Um, I would uh, give a lot of props to the, the Lightning Project because they really have done that math and kind of figured out how to do um, you know, these kinds of high frequency transactions on Bitcoin um, with conditions, so they support hash locks. Um, so you know, when the Lightning comes out, we would be able to just use that. Um, otherwise, you know, we could try to figure it out ourselves if there's someone in the community that's like really deep into Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> um, that might be possible. Um, I think we could spend an hour just talking about all the nuances of that. I, um, I think on a high level, you probably need um, seg uh, segregated witnesses, which uh, hopefully is going to launch soon, um, and you need uh, basically hash locks to 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 set up the transaction and, and trigger it based on the condition. So, um, yeah, with those basic building blocks, you should be able to figure it out. But there are lots of nuances, lots of attacks, and things that you have to think about. Just to mention, so a, a lot mm -hmm. of the the complexity that's dealt with in, in terms of dealing with any specific ledger type, whether it's Bitcoin or something else, that's all in the, the ledger plugins, which we'll get into a little bit more later. So from the interledger layer, we have kind of an abstraction over this is all the th these these are the basic functions of a ledger, and so then the people who write the actual plugins to support a specific ledger type, they have to figure out what's the most sensible way of supporting this particular ledger. And so we're kind of giving a framework for people to like expose these functions in, but not specifying how, what's the best way to do that for Bitcoin or Ethereum or all, all of the specific ones. Yeah, I think the reason that we're working on these simple packet formats and not on the ledger plugins because we're not as smart as some of the other people out there. So, uh. Hi, it's Adrian from Visa. So I'm just asking in terms of if you're incentivizing each of the connectors and you've got a really long path, aren't you making that transaction more expensive? Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the things that like comes up a lot is, is uh, people wondering how long the path is actually going to be. Um, and so the only time that you would have a longer path is if it was a cheaper path than any short path that's available. Um, so what we're basically doing is we're, we're trying to describe all the paths that are out there 
and yeah, if you know, if Visa is a connector in the system and it connects basically everybody, then yeah, most of the transaction will go through it. Um, but I think the point is to um, encourage that sort of competition so that you can see um, whatever the cheapest rate is, whether it's a long path, a short path, maybe you can cut across um, with, with, with a lateral path somewhere. Um, and so you know, networks are very good at finding the, the most efficient route, whether it be long or short. There's also an element of like, it may be that traversing the world, like the whole globe, there's only a handful of like really, there could end up being like a handful of very big networks that have you know very low cost of capital and can do this very efficiently. Um, but then as Stefan was kind of alluding to these little bit more advanced use cases where you can start thinking of other things as ledgers that are connected in this system. And so my, my car or my phone could have a little ledger inside of it. And so, that's also why you need this type of protocol to really extend the chain through, even if like most of the, a lot of the money and the currency exchange goes through not that many players because they just can do it more cheaply and efficiently, that's perfectly fine as long as then we can extend it out to re really reaching everybody, even if that big player doesn't reach, reach all the way out. Have you um, built any real-world connectors between real cryptocurrency networks, let's say between the Bitcoin uh, network and the Ripple consensus ledger that would connect pre-funded XRP with Bitcoin or Ethers or something like that, something that's, that's real and that, that's demonstrable in, in an environment like this? Um, so we have a talk coming on later, which is basically showing off um, a connector uh, written against a real money ledger, not a cryptocurrency. Um, we've also done a test internally at Ripple using the Ripple test network um, and a feature we call suspended payments. Um, now, one of the things about uh, distributed ledgers is that, you know, they are quite slow to upgrade. You know, Bitcoin is waiting for segregated witnesses in order to support this properly. Um, we are waiting for uh, finishing suspended payments in order to support this properly. Um, and so it will probably be some time delay before you can actually see this, like, running at scale. Um, what would be possible would be um, writing a slightly simpler integration that maybe doesn't provide, like, the, the speed that you might want in practice. Um, and so some of those things I think are, are going to be ha happening soon, but no, we haven't um, uh, done that yet. Um, but expect that over the next couple months, I think, uh, just some progress on that. Wait for the or third Or possibly workshop. this afternoon. Third workshop. <laughs> Yeah, or, this or, afternoon. or possibly this afternoon. Totally, yeah. yeah we're, we're very much looking for, so one of the things that we've been working on most of late has been kind of a major overhaul of our of the existing reference implementation to support this ledger plugin architecture. Because when we started out, we were kind of like, okay, let's just build every all the components that we need. And we started by just building a simple centralized ledger, which is the thing that underlies the red and blue demo. Uh, and that, that was just like, okay, let's just, Pretend we had every feature we could ask for. Let's just build the full stack and then figure out, figure out how to connect it. And then what we've been working on more recently is, okay, let's overhaul all the other pieces so that they don't assume anything about the ledgers that they're talking to and use this plug-in architecture to support other types of ledgers. But that's one of the, it's one of the kind of cutting cutting edge of interledger stuff that we're that we're working on. So it's not we're not we've only we're only now getting to the point where we can really just say to people, hey, if you're a Bitcoin expert, want to help us figure out how to support Bitcoin with interledger, or you're an Ethereum expert, want to help us do that, or big chain DB, like what, whatever it is, um, we're we're now at the point where we're trying to engage people who are interested in figuring out how to do this for different types of ledgers so that we can wire up demos like that to show off money, money moving through really different types of ledgers.